Network documentation is fun. Now, I'm not usually one to state the obvious, so there must be some opinions to the contrary of that statement. Truth be told, if you were to talk to network engineers around the world, they would all say network documentation is important. But there's this strange dichotomy between network engineers believing documentation is important and network engineers actually keeping up-to-date network documentation for their environments. If you were to corner one of them and say, why don't you keep up-to-date documentation? They would probably say, I'm too busy. Which really means they didn't make the time because we will make the time for things that are important to us. Now, don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that all network engineers fail to create documentation. A lot of them do. But I am convinced there's probably three or four reasons why documentation can easily fall to the wayside. Number one, there's no instant gratification. The actual doing part of IT is exciting. You get to type in commands and see immediate results of things taking place. Some of those things could be good, some of those things could be bad, but at the end of the day, things are happening. With documentation, you just have a long churn, like writing an essay in school. That doesn't feel very exciting. The second reason I would say network engineers can fail to document is there can be environments where there's no accountability. Because networks usually remain stable after they're set up, you'll run into many environments where there's just one network engineer on staff. And that can often mean that nobody checks their work. Creating good documentation then becomes a true self-discipline. And if you're not a self-disciplined person, you can make all sorts of excuses. Kind of like buying a gym membership because you think that'll motivate you to go. But then you quickly realize that nobody's really checking to see if you go. Enough said. The third reason why is what I call the dream tool conquest. After about 30 minutes of documentation, a network engineer often thinks, you know what? I bet you somebody's created an automated tool that does this for me. And if you Google it, you'll find all kinds of things people are trying to sell you to automate network documentation. Now I can tell you after being in network engineering for 20 years, there is no such thing. There's all kinds of tools that will spit out a bunch of stuff that you then have to organize, but there's no magical tool that just documents the entire network for you. Regardless, this gives network engineers an excuse. They'll install some quote unquote dream tool, get it halfway working, and then think to themselves, oh, if I can just get that tool working, then I don't have to document anymore. I'm here to tell you there is no such thing. That sounds very demoralizing, but give up now. The last one is similar, and that is engineers have no template or centralized storage location. Meaning, after they try looking for a dream tool and realize there really is no such thing, they create some network documentation that looks a certain way for the job, and they save it to their desktop on their laptop. And then three months later, they create some other documentation that looks a little different, and they put that on the shared drive. And then three months later, they forget that they stored one on their desktop and create a duplicate of it somewhere in Office 365 or Google Docs. And at some point, finally just say, ah, it's all scattered and out of date, and I don't even know what's what, and forget it and they simply give up on documentation. So we are gonna be talking all about documentation in this module. I'm gonna give you quite a bit, but I wanna get you started with the ultimate documentation tool, and it is, drum roll please, Microsoft Excel. Some people cheer, some people groan. Regardless, Excel is hugely valuable for storing ordered data sets. It really is a micro-sized database that you can save just about anywhere. For example, here's an Excel spreadsheet that I just created for the office that I'm standing in right now. It shows the switch that's in this environment, the ports of the switch, what wall jack those terminate to, and what is actually plugged into that wall jack. Now, it's not all the devices, and I have seen some places where they will document every single port and what's plugged in there, but our environments are so dynamic nowadays, it becomes a lot to keep up with. So what I'll usually do is document key switch ports. <laughs> and I got a fight already. I'm getting into explaining how to do the documentation instead of just talking about the tool. This is Excel. If you haven't seen it before, please get familiar with it. You will be using it in the network world. The beauty of Excel is it's completely free form. So you can create your own structure that fits your environment as you figure out what your standard will be. Now, the best advice I can give you beyond that is to combine it with a cloud-based system for on-site work. One of the reasons our documentation ends up way out of date is because we store that Excel spreadsheet somewhere. Maybe it's on our computer at work or at home or on a USB drive. 
somewhere that's not with us all the time. So you end up on site and you go, oh man, um, I don't have my Excel spreadsheet. Uh, I'll create another one. And it doesn't look the same and it has different information. And then you forget to merge them all together and it all falls apart. Throw that Excel spreadsheet into Office 365. That's OneDrive or in Google Docs or set up your own little private cloud. That's what I do. I have a little Synology drive, which has its own cloud replication system where I install a client on my laptop and any changes that I make to the spreadsheets on there automatically replicate back to my centralized storage system. So I'm accessing the same file no matter where I am. Now there's obviously a lot more to know about network documentation, but my hope is to get you started because the truth is when you have a system that works, network documentation really is fun. It feels good to create a documented map of your network environment that you know will be worth its weight in gold down the road. Creating physical diagrams. Logical network diagrams are great. They give you a big picture perspective of what the network looks like and what's connected to what. But there is a reason that Google Maps has a logical perspective, showing you an overhead view of what the city looks like, and they have a street view, which is a physical perspective of what that neighborhood literally looks like. Sometimes when you're driving around looking at the map, it's hard to relate what you're seeing from the overhead view to the brick wall that you're going by. That's why the street view is so valuable. And in the same sense, looking at the logical diagram gives you a big picture perspective of the network. But oftentimes it's hard to relate that logical diagram to what you literally see when you walk in the server room. This is a picture from the IT expert cabling series where I literally did a complete network installation at a new office suite and videotaped the whole thing. Now looking at this rack, there's a big difference between what I would draw as a logical diagram and a physical diagram. I'm just going to hand sketch what the logical diagram would look like. I'd have a switch. We'll call it switch one, a couple of redundant connections down here to switch two and two connections out of both of these switches, which go to another office space. Something like that. That would be a logical diagram. I might number the ports on there as well. Port 48 here, port 48 here, 47 here, 47 here. And maybe that's port one on both sides. Now in a network this simple, that logical architecture might do. But as your networks get bigger and bigger and more complex, you may want a physical or what's often called a wireframe diagram. Now the tool I'm using for this is Lucid Charts, but you can also use Visio or whatever your preferred network diagram tool is. If you're a Mac user, you might look at OmniGraffle to do this. And you can see that I've brought over the icon set for server racks here. I'm going to drag a server rack onto the screen and I'm going to adjust it because the server rack that we had in that little room I just showed you, this guy right here, is actually known as a 12U rack. That means it has space for 12 units to be installed in that rack. So right here in Lucid Charts, I'm going to adjust the size to 12. Hit enter and I shorten my rack. I then reach over here for an ethernet switch. Notice, click, it mounts right in there. I would then name it switch one to relate it to the logical diagram that I created. That way I can easily move back and forth between the two and relate them. Now you notice it gives me the option. Is that a one U device? Is that a two U device? Because there are often network devices that consume multiple units. In this case, mine's a standard one U stackable switch. Now jumping back to my picture, that's the switch up top. Then I had two U of cable management right there. Now as I hover over these icons, I can see that there's no cable management in this picture. Oftentimes you may just have to take something like a blank slot and label it cable management or whatever device that is. Cable management to you. Looking back at the physical picture, I now have one U of patch paneling followed by another U of patch panel. <laughs> Did I say patch paneling? It's like drywall, my friend. Now they do have an icon for patch panel. Slide that right there and right there. 2U of patch paneling. <laughs> I kind of like that. Then another little 2U cable manager. I didn't put the little cover over that yet. Followed by a 1U switch at the bottom. Now it's not shown here, but I actually have a PDU in the back. A PDU is a power distribution unit. Think of it as a rack mountable power strip. What you'll see people do sometimes is say server rack, front view, then they'll make a copy paste of that into a rear view. In my case, I'm not going to do that because the PDU is the only thing mounted in the back and I don't really need to see it. I'll just slide in my 2U of cable management and my last ethernet switch. We'll call that switch two. That is a physical diagram. Snapshot. And let's paste that side by side. Shoop. By combining logical and physical diagrams, you should be able to accurately describe just about any network environment. Now a word of caution, and I mention this every time I talk about creating diagrams, keep the majority of your data where your data belongs in a spreadsheet. 
For instance, I've seen physical diagrams and logical diagrams where people are trying to jam in port numbers and IP addresses and serial numbers and warranty dates and purchase dates and blah, 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 blah. And before long, this little diagram ends up just a mess. Remember the intention of the physical diagram. It's to help you relate what you see in a network diagram to what's physically there when you walk in the IT room. Imagine supporting this network remotely with somebody on the other end of the phone that doesn't usually work with network devices. If you've got this at your disposal, you could be talking them through it. Yep, Sally, I need you to unplug the bottom switch. You should see at the bottom of your network rack. T tell me if you see it. There should be a switch there that has some blinking lights. Does it have the label on the front of it that says switch two? Yeah, that's the one. Reach behind it, pull that power cord out. <laughs> now, obviously, I don't have a label there that says switch two. We're gonna talk about that in another nugget. But just based on this diagram, you can walk Sally through doing a remote reboot of a network device that might be frozen. Naming conventions and labeling. So it's 7.30 at night and I hear my doorbell ring, kind of unusual. So I go to the door and there's my neighbor standing with water dripping from his hands in this little Ziploc bag with this guy in it. She said, we're about to leave on a vacation and our fish tank just cracked. We are gonna get rid of it, but we know that you have a bunch of kids and they might like this fish. So without even thinking, I grab the bag and my neighbor turns and walks away. I turn around to my house. My five-year-old comes running up and goes, Harvey. That's simply because I name every animal Harvey. And soon thereafter, all my children are dancing around saying, we have a fish. And Jeremy's going on Amazon Prime to order a little $20 fish tank to put him in. Six months later, he's still there. Harvey the fish. Well, little known fact, just like Harvey the fish, our network devices have names too. As a matter of fact, this is a screenshot of one of the switches that was just pulled out of the box. Going through the initial configuration, it has the name switch DC86D0. Seems kind of random until you think, oh, so its name is actually switch followed by the last six digits of the MAC address of the switch. That's just what it is when you pull it out of the box. Now, one of the first steps that you walk through when you configure a network device is to give it a name. And so people scratch their head and say, well, what do I name it? Well, I dare you to Google that. You'll find opinions of every sort on a network device naming convention. And I'm not gonna give you the answer. So I'd like to walk through what your options are for naming your network devices, and then give you what I would suggest. The first style of naming that I've seen is people pick a theme. They might choose Sesame Street as their theme and name their router Big Bird, and the first switch Elmo. Or they might choose The Matrix by far the best movie ever created, and name their main server Neo, and the switches Trinity and Morpheus and so on. The problem with picking these themes is that you still need network documentation surrounding those naming conventions to have them make any sense at all. For instance, if a consultant were to come into your network and say, okay, I'm on the Neo switch, <laughs> what does that mean? You'd have to produce some kind of network documentation to say, oh, Neo is actually over in that rack over there. It powers these devices and so on and so forth. And I want to emphasize my second statement right here. Names can't replace good documentation, but it sure can help. What that means is no matter what naming convention you choose, it doesn't replace good network documentation, logical diagrams, physical diagrams, spreadsheets listing key connections and IP addresses. But setting up your naming convention correctly can really help you be more efficient when working with these network devices. Now these two down here feel more efficient, but they're actually not much better than the first two. Switch five might be the fifth switch that you've installed. But again, if I'm a consultant walking in, what would be the first question? Switch five, where's that? You'd have to pull out the network diagram and show me. Same thing right here. Maybe you have a network that spans between Texas and Arizona and you name one of the switches Texas 2, which kind of gives you a sense. Well, at least you know I'm in Texas, but okay, give me the network diagram. What does that mean? Over here are names of a different caliber, each one of them providing a little different perspective. For instance, you might name one of your switches RTST1SW1, and that might mean Resolution Tech, which maybe is the name of the company. Suite 1, letting you know which building that's in, and then switch one in that suite. Now, if I'm a consultant telnetting in, after that brief explanation, as I move between different switches and I look at suite one becoming suite four and switch one becoming switch two, I at least have a, a general sense of where I am in navigating those switches. 
This is just a different form of the same thing. Maybe you're a managed service provider or a consulting company and you have many different clients. So you start giving your clients identifiers. For instance, 1001 might really equal resolution tech. But you don't want to use a name convention like that because maybe you have Resolution Tech and Ronnie's Tree Houses and you end up with duplicates that way. So you come up with a little identifier for what those clients are. B1 might be Building 1. Switch 5 might be Switch 5 in that building. Now take a look at this one right here. It's the mother name of them all. You might name your switches NA, which stands for North America. PHX AZ01, which stands for Phoenix, Arizona, Site 1. Building 2, Floor 5, Closet 1, Router 5. I guess that wouldn't be a switch in that case. It would be a router. Now, you might look at that and go, that's crazy. Who would do that? A ah, larger company. I've seen it all the time. I've seen some naming conventions so complex, they actually write white papers to describe what each character means in the naming convention. That, in my opinion, is a little self-defeating. This is about as complex as you can get before you start having to reference documentation to find out what each section of the name means. This last one gets a little bit into switch design. When you design a network, you typically design it in layers. So you have your core switches up at the top and those connect down to what's known as your distribution switches. Those then would connect down to your access switches. And this is just as your switch network grows and so on and so forth. And I'm not really here to talk about switch design. I'm just talking about naming convention. You might name it as to where it fits in the design. For instance, 1001 might be that resolution tech client. And this is their access switch number five or their core switch number one. So three major genres of naming conventions that you could use. Somewhat random, what I would call small business, large business, and design base. I guess that would be four different styles of naming convention. My advice, use either this one or this one. This would be your small business naming convention. This would be your large. It makes no sense to come up with a naming convention like this when you're managing two switches installed inside of Pet's Carnival. Oh, don't you just want to take them home? But when Pet Carnival expands to a national chain, you want to be able to move from a naming convention like this into a naming convention that can represent many different stores in many different states and tell you exactly where those network devices are. Remember, as network engineers, we can manage everything from a single point. So you could be sitting on the beach in California managing a thousand Pet Carnival stores. That naming convention can really help identify what device you're actually managing. The last thing worth mentioning is labeling. Grab a little P-Touch printer like this, print out some labels, trim those things down, and physically stick them on the switches in your environment. That is what allows you to tie what's physically there when you walk into the room to the logical and physical diagrams you've created. Documenting wiring and port locations. When creating network documentation, you might have the logical network diagram, which looks something like this, showing switches, which could be represented by shapes or symbols, and what interfaces are connected to what. You might also have a physical network diagram, which is also called a wireframe, which shows how the rack literally looks if you were to stand in front of it. But on both of those diagram types, they're not designed for a whole lot of data. That's where your best documentation tool is always Microsoft Excel or one of the other Excel-like alternatives. Now, if you go over to cbtnuggets.com, you'll find this course called IT Expertise Building and Configuring a Business Switch Network. And there's one video that I would commend to you if you are interested in learning the basics of Excel in order to create that network documentation. It's called Creating Documentation for Reels. And that's where I go in and show how to use the basics of Excel, how to create fields and merge them together. I mean, just a lot of people I find when they get into the network engineering space have never really even used Excel before. That's what this video is all about. So I don't want to duplicate that information here. Rather, I want to give you an idea of the types of network documentation that you can create to record all the network data. This first example that I have is called a patch map. Now, that's a name that I came up with. You probably won't find that listed as an official title anywhere. But what this is, is showing every patch panel port that we have. For instance, this is Suite 113 Patch Panel 1 and all the ports that are available on it and what switch it connects to. Now, in the ideal world, every patch panel port is a one-to-one -one relationship with the switch. So patch panel port 1 would match to switch port 1 and 2 and so on and so forth. But in the real world, that's not a reality. For example, I just took a picture of the rack of equipment in the MDF just down the hall from me. 
And I know it's hard to see because all the cables are black, but this is the patch panel, and you can see it's fishing down here, and fishing down here, and fishing down here, and so on and so forth, into the individual switch ports. But the thing is, you run into things like this server. Now, that server has two individual network cards that come out of it. That's going to plug in maybe right there, or right there. Actually, that'd be a piece of plastic. I mean, up there to a place you can't see above there that, that has another switch inside of it. The point is, this is going to throw off your scheme. If you've got a 24-port patch panel and a 24-port switch, and then you throw a few server ports and maybe your internet connection ports and maybe this UPS has a port that would plug into there. It's going to throw off your numbering. I wish it wouldn't, but that's the reality. So you might have a jump here from port 17 to port 20 where patch panel port 18 lines up to 20 and so on and so forth. Then over here, I have the destination information, which would list where that patch panel connects to in a wall jack and general information. I created this sheet to actually test this site where we could go around with cable testers and make sure everything was good. So the cable tester we used reported back how long the cable run was and whether it was good or bad, and we would add any notes to the spreadsheet. That's one example of port documentation. Then over here, I have a switch map, and this is where I actually said, okay, from the switch perspective, which ports connect to what? Now you can see most of this is duplicated from the sheet before. It's just a little bit more concise because this one isn't so much focused on testing cables as it is in saying what switch ports connect to what devices. You might create a switch data tab, which shows the switches that you have in your environment, what model they are, serial number information, IP address information, warranty information. You could go on and on and on, firmware versions, et cetera, et cetera. It really just gets down to how much flair do you want to add to your documentation. More information isn't always better because remember, the more information you record, that's the more upkeep you have to have every single time a change is made. So I thought I would make a list of the types of network documentation you should and could create. The ones in red are what I would consider critical, like every network environment should have these. The ones in blue are what I would consider useful, as in having this would save you some time down the road, but it's not going to cause you much pain if you don't have them. A physical cable map represents patch panel port connections to the jacks in the wall. A switch port map represents what devices plug into what ports on the switch. The service rider connection and contact information represents who is your internet service provider and who should you call and what account information should you give them if your internet connection goes down. I can't tell you how many times I've been at a place where a connection has gone down and I go, I don't even know who the ISP is for this site. And we're digging through file folders while all the employees sit there and wait. IP address allocations. What IP addresses are assigned to what devices? a logical and physical network diagram, a vault that contains the credentials to allow you to administer the network devices. Some free ones are things like password safe or key pass. One that I've started using lately is a cloud-based one called 1Password. That being said, there's a billion password managers out there. Rack layout, that's a wireframe document showing what the physical rack looks like. WAP layout, showing where the wireless access points are installed in the company. Asset tracking, showing serial numbers, purchase dates, warranty information for all your network devices. And lastly, the spanning tree protocol snapshot. You'll find as you get deeper into networking that switches have a built-in feature called spanning tree, or at least a lot of them do, that prevents loops in your environment by blocking redundant connections. It's really good to know which connections are blocked and which ones are active for your troubleshooting purposes. Standard operating procedures and work instructions. Have you guys ever heard the phrase shooting from the hip? It actually comes from the old Western days when the fastest way to shoot in a duel would be to pull your gun quickly from the holster, point it while it was right at the hip and shooting. It's definitely not the most accurate way to shoot, but if speed is the key, you might have a fighting chance. When it comes to the technology space, you'll usually find two different types of personalities, network engineers and IT technicians in general that just shoot from the hip. And it encompasses everything that they do from troubleshooting. They'll walk up and be like, ooh, try this, try this, try this. Ooh, click that. Ooh, uh, click over here. Plug this in here. All the way to installing new networks. Uh, how about we put that switch there? Yeah, that looks good. Okay, connect those cables. Okay, yeah, I think, I think that'll work. Okay, right. Whereas the other personality is one who follows a methodical process. And it encompasses everything they do. From troubleshooting. Um, just a moment, man. I need to create a ticket for this. Can you give me all of your information? Can you describe exactly what the problem is? I want to make sure that I know exactly what I'm solving here. All the way to implementations. 
No, wait a sec, we don't have a plan for this. Where's the wireframe document of how those devices should be installed? Where's the spreadsheet showing which ports connect to what? I can't install this switch before we've got all of that documentation in place. A truly successful technician will actually have a mix of both. Just like a strange breed of dog, a good network engineer will be about 10% shoot from the hip, 90% methodical process. The experience and maturity of that technician is what guides them to move out of the shoot from the hip world into the other. I've met a lot of technicians, network and otherwise, that are stuck in this world. Their entire life consists of shooting from the hip. And their job typically consists of coming in every day and putting out fires. But their whole personality fights against moving into a more methodical process. Now it's possible to swing too far in the methodical process world. As a matter of fact, I literally just got off the phone about an hour ago with Microsoft support. I'm not sure if you've ever experienced it before. I have many times. And I can tell you that I will do everything in my power to keep from calling Microsoft support. I was actually dealing with an exchange issue. I couldn't figure it out. I spent days and finally hit the wall and said, that's it. I've got to open a Microsoft support case. I hung my head in shame. Now I can tell you that Microsoft support is probably the best I've seen in terms of knowing the products that they support. Their process, however, is so methodical. It will cost you probably at least a couple hours before you really get into the nitty gritty troubleshooting. But the fact is it has to be that way. I was working with them to troubleshoot an exchange server cluster of eight server that supported more than 2000 people. One misstep on their part could cause the entire organization to go down. So literally I would be on the phone with him. He would say, I'm going to suggest we type this command. This is what the command does. This is the impact it could have. Would you like me to type that command right now? Me as the customer would then sit and go, okay, let's do that. Or, and I said this many times, no, I'm not going to prove that command until we get to an after hours time. Depending on the risk of the issue that you're troubleshooting, you may want that kind of methodical process. I did. If that Microsoft engineer was shooting from the hip, I would have disconnected his remote session really fast. Now these processes in IT have become so common, they've been formalized in many different best practice documentations. They're called standard operating procedures and work instructions. A standard operating procedure, simply put, identifies what to do in a job and who is responsible for it. Now, when you hear job, you're probably thinking of career, and that's not what I'm saying. Job can boil down to a specific set of activities. Your career may have many different jobs involved. For instance, as a network engineer, you may have a standard operating procedure around a switch infrastructure installation. You may have a different standard operating procedure around a wireless network installation and so on and so on it goes. A standard operating procedure might be something like perform an initial site survey, establish initial WAP installation locations, third, install your WAPs. Obviously a really basic high level standard operating procedure, but I'm using it to demonstrate a point. Each one of these should then line up to work instructions. For example, how do you do a site survey? Or more specifically, how do you do a site survey so it happens the same way every single time? Let me give you a really practical example of these two things with something that we do every day at my organization. We use a cloud-based documentation system called Confluence. You might have heard of it before as our central documentation store for everything that we do. One of the services that we support at my company is voice over IP. We call it Campus Voice. We have a standard operating procedure called finding the IP address of a voice over IP phone. It is one job of many things that those responsible for supporting voice over IP platforms have to be able to do. Now you'll notice we have the author listed right here, as well as the last modified date, two key pieces of standard operating procedures and work instructions. And then from there, we have the step-by-step -step process to go through and determine the IP address assigned to a specific phone. We show this for not only Cisco phones, but Grandstream phones, which is another vendor of IP phone that we support in our environment. Every single time someone wants to determine the IP address of the phone, walking through this process will do it. Now that may seem really tedious if you live in a shoot from the hip world, 
You might think, I know how to figure out the IP address on a phone. And you probably do. But the longer you work in technology, the more you start realizing there's more stuff out there than I have capacity to store in my brain. It won't be too long before you start finding you have to Google everything every single time you get involved in a troubleshooting situation. And those troubleshooting situations may be happening because you're not implementing it the same way every single time. Thus, I come back to the title slide. This is the whole purpose of standard operating procedures and work instructions. The larger your organization grows, the more essential they are to your ability to grow. Understanding change management. I want you to close your eyes and imagine the situation with me. You're at a family gathering, eating some lunch, munching on a sandwich, just chit-chatting with all your family members, and your favorite uncle leans over and goes, hey, got a computer question for you. <laughs> By the way, if you're in IT, that's going to happen. Everybody's got a computer question for you. He goes, so last week I'm working on my laptop and I start getting these pop-ups for stock investments, and I keep getting them all the time now. How, how, how do I get rid of them? What's the first question that you're probably going to ask? Well, I know what I would ask. Did you download anything recently? Did you visit any unusual websites recently? Have you opened any email attachments that seemed mysterious lately? Essentially, I'm trying to boil down what have you done recently that has caused some malware to get installed on your computer? Because we all know ads don't just start showing up. Microsoft doesn't put ads inside of Windows and neither does Apple put them inside of OS X. Something had to have changed. Something had to have been installed to cause those stock investment pop-ups to shoot up on the screen. And it's the same thing in a network environment. I have a very difficult truth for you. And I don't want you to spread this around, but it is a fact. The vast majority of system and network outages are caused by me and you and everybody who signs up for this world of information technology. Now you may stand up defensively and say, well, isn't there power outages? Of course there are. Don't service providers go down? Yes, they do. Don't data centers have issues too? Absolutely. But all of those things added together can't even come close to the number of outages that IT people themselves cause by not following good practice. Thus, when it comes to troubleshooting a network environment, the first question that you have to ask is, what changed? Now, it's a simple question, but in our world of complex systems and multiple hands touching those systems, there's been developed an entire practice around managing change in our environment that is literally called change management. I like this definition of it. It says the controlled identification and implementation of required changes within a computer system. It's time to apply a feature pack, a service pack. Time to reboot that server. Hey, I just want to add a VLAN over there. Hey, I'm going to connect this WAP over in this corner of the building. All the stuff that we do on a routine basis can cause a disruption to the system. So we have to identify those changes and implement them in a controlled fashion, not to mention document them so that if something goes wrong a day later, or a week later, or a month later. You can trace your steps back to figure out why that thing is happening. I actually love change management because I've experienced the pain of not having it. And if you'd like to get into this world, I'd really suggest grabbing this book. This book is just great to read no matter what. It's called The Phoenix Project. You can grab it off Amazon. It's somebody who took the practices of ITIL which I'm going to tell you about in just a second, and put them in novel form. There's this guy who's just doing his job, you know, punching the clock, and he gets promoted to a director of IT services at this organization that is just a mess. It's, it's a great read. And by the time it's ended done, you'll be like, oh man, this is, I really want to get into it. <laughs> and then you'll dive into ITIL. And then you'll say, I really didn't want to get into this. ITIL is literally a system designed to say this is the best way of implementing IT services. You can imagine just how big that is. As a matter of fact, you could study for years and probably not reach the end of the ITIL documentation that has been created. But the fact is, there's a whole lot of people that are smarter than you and I, and they got together and said, let's create a system of systems for people to implement so that they can control their IT services. Now, trust me, you don't have to become an ITIL ninja before you begin your own change log. What you're looking at is something simple that I started a long time ago to keep track of changes within the business that I run. 
<laughs> you might be looking at it going, you're not tracking many changes. Well, that's because I just isolated it to a small little segment of changes that's focused on what we call the internet edge. Not to mention, I filtered it around a lot of the sensitive changes that I just don't want you to see. For example, let me just click on this one right here. Notice I've got a date that this change was implemented, a big picture subject of what was done, the person who did it, that's me, the reason the change was made, and exactly what changes I put into place to do whatever change was needed. Now, normally you would have an approved by, meaning somebody that you bounced it off of that said, yeah, 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 that's good. That's a good idea. Let's do that. I chose to forego that simply because, well, I really have no reason for choosing to forego that. I just did. Configuration and performance baselines. So you've rolled out the network. It's now humming along and functional. What do you do with your days? Well, you go to Disneyland, of course. But after you've ridden all the rides, you have to come back to your normal day job. And outside of upgrades, most of it is going to be finding and solving problems. Well, depending on the type and size of network that you're operating, you may have very few or you may have a lot of ongoing issues to solve. One of the common things that arises is configuration changes on devices. Now, there's another video at CBT Nuggets recorded on change management, ensuring that changes don't happen without authorization, but the fact is sometimes they do. How do you put in a level of accountability? It's for this reason that we introduce configuration management. The whole goal is to manage the configuration of your devices for two reasons. One, you want to make sure that changes aren't happening without your knowledge. And if they do happen, you know what those changes are. The second is if this switch bursts into flames or a cup of coffee spills into that firewall and shorts out the whole platform, you've got a backup of all the configuration. So all you need to do is swap out the device and restore the configuration to get your network operational again. The good news is that there are some great tools out there to help you along with this. A few that I've used personally is first off this one called Cat Tools. It used to be owned by this company called Kiwi until they were swallowed up by a larger organization called SolarWinds. What this allows you to do is to add a list of devices and you can group them together, name them, type in the IP addresses of those devices, and then schedule specific tasks that you want to run on a certain interval. You can see that I have a task here, device backup running config that runs once a day. You can see down here, it actually ran at 746 this morning. Now, in order for this tool to be successful, you actually have to add the device and the model and how you're going to access the device along with all the passwords that you need to get into the device. But once you've added your database of devices, this thing just churns. At any given point in time, I can go to the view menu, hit configs folder, and there's the group that I created, US 3001, and there's the switch that I'm backing up as of midnight last night is the latest backup. I can open it up and there's my configuration if I ever need to restore it from backup. Likewise, if anything changes in the configuration from the last time it was in there, Cat Tools automatically emails out a report that highlights the configuration change that was made. You can see I did one purposely right here. I went under the interface, gig ethernet one, and added the description of test. The next time the system ran, it goes, ah, there's a change and sent this email to me. Now imagine having that level of visibility inside of your network that if any device configuration change, boom, you get an immediate email. Imagine how fast you can arrive at a troubleshooting conclusion being like, oh, well, there's, there's the problem. Somebody added a VLAN last night or whatever the configuration change was. Now I'm talking a lot about cat tools because it's the configuration management tool that I've used the most. And it's one of the cheapest, at least it used to be before SolarWinds bought it. But there's other ones out there like rconfig. I'm so handicapped when it comes to writing lowercase. That is an open source one that runs on Linux, does something very similar to cat tools. So if you're a Linux person, our config can be pretty sweet. Once you get beyond these two, the price just goes through the roof because you're into the enterprise grade software. Things like Manage Engine, SolarWinds Network Configuration Manager, or Orion. There's a platform called What's Up Gold that does configuration management. All of these things are into the thousands, if not tens of thousands of dollars. The second thing that you'll want when you return from your Disneyland vacation is performance monitoring. My arrow went right to this line because this is usually where you start running into bandwidth constraints. Too many people downloading something from the internet, a file backup happening during business hours that slows the whole network down. Those kind of things are really difficult to detect because the end result is people just say, my computer feels slow. Those are the worst kind of issues to troubleshoot. Could be the computer, could be the software, could be the network. And to help remedy that, you need some kind of network performance monitoring. 
An open source tool that is great is one called MRTG. It has been around since the dawn of creation. God said, let there be light, then he created MRTG. A long time ago, a company in Germany called Passler created something similar called PRTG. Let me give you an example of what these look like. So this is a somewhat sterilized view of PRTG, meaning I've scrolled all the sensitive information off the screen. But this is a monitoring view of our firewall, meaning the firewall that runs the office that I'm talking to you from right now. First thing that my eyes always track to is the wide area network, meaning the internet connection. CBI, that stands for Cox Business Internet, who's our service provider out here in Arizona. And I can see that there's 16 megabits per second of traffic coursing through that connection right now. If I click on that, I can actually get a few averages. Meaning, I'm talking to you right now, it's about 8 a.m. I can click on the graph over the last four hours and see that, you know what, there's not much going on before 6.35 a.m. That's actually right about when I got into the office today. Logged in, checked email, and then you can see I really started doing stuff. I don't know exactly what that stuff is. Other people started coming into the office and doing stuff as well. And you can see the bandwidth going up over time. So the, the, the big perspective I want to give you is it's impossible to know if 16 megabits per second is normal, unless you do some trending, some averages overall, this is known as a baseline, establishing your performance baseline. I'll come back here and say, well, show me over the last 365 days since you've been monitoring this firewall, what the average has been. And I can look and say, okay, well, looks like over one day averages, the average speed is about three megabits per second. The peak speed on average throughout a day, and notice I'm emphasizing on average, is 13 megabits per second. That's when you average from midnight all the way through 24 hours to the next midnight what the speed is. So 13 megabits per second means that we probably had a pretty heavy hitting day, given that after five o'clock, most people go home and that average comes way down. Performance monitoring tools like this can also give you unusual statistics. For instance, it says right here, the CBT Nuggets traffic, the one day average interval of 40 kilobits per second is unusually low for this weekday. <laughs> what it's saying is, Jeremy, you're slacking. You need to get online a little more. And I joke about it, but these kind of things are really valuable. You have the user saying, hey, everything's running slow. How awesome would it be for you to log in and pull up your monitoring software to find out, man, there's something consuming the internet traffic. As a matter of fact, it even alerted me that it's unusually high for this weekday. From there, you can zone right in to find out what device is sucking up all the traffic. Thanks for watching our second and press the button below, like, subscribe, and bell icon.